To discuss Mandela's legacy, uh, let's meet our panel from Cape Town. Ambassador Ibrahim Rasul is the former South African ambassador to the United States. From Johannesburg, Adetunji Omotola is an African analyst. Adam Habib, the vice chancellor of the University of the Witwatersrand, joins us from Los Angeles. And here in our studio, veteran South African journalist Simon Barber. Welcome to all of you. Ambassador Rasul, let me start with you. Let's talk about Nelson Mandela. He was, of course, the anti-apartheid activist who spent 27 years in prison, then steered the country to democracy and served one term as president of South Africa. What, in your view, did he leave South Africa? What, where do we see his imprint today in South Africa? Look, I think that um, Nelson Mandela's imprint is really strong across South Africa, if not across the world. I think that um, the legacy of problem solving, the legacy of political um, transitional management, and the legacy certainly of sacrifice towards all of that. I think that if one looks at the way in which the Arab Spring had gone, one can only now begin even more to appreciate the statesmanship of a Nelson Mandela, the craftsmanship of a Nelson Mandela, because you had Egypt um, without that kind of wisdom um, being susceptible um, to the kind of counter-revolutions. You've had the same pushback in Tunisia and many other places. And so I think we can appreciate Nelson Mandela's legacy even more, mm -hmm. given recent history. Right, but Ambassador, you know, if you look uh, at Nelson Mandela, he talked about consultation, he talked about tolerance. Do we see that in South Africa today? Look, I think that we're trying to regain it in South Africa. I think we've come and emerged out of a very difficult decade in which everything that Nelson Mandela stood for, we found the opposite. I think that, um, that where Nelson Mandela stood for non-racial unity, we have now fratricided into tribalism and racial polarization again, and we're trying to pick that up where Nelson Mandela had a sense of a balance between growth and development and distribution. I think that we had a decade where there was very little growth and lots of emphasis only on distribution, and I think we're trying to find the balance again um, within all of that. And so I think that um, the last century is defined by the very opposite, uh, the last decade, sorry, is defined by the very opposite of what Mandela stood for. But there's a great optimism in South Africa today. I think after a few months, President Cyril Ramaphosa's approval ratings is in the high 60%, and it shows that South Africans are ready to embrace not just moderation, but balance again, and unity again, and reconciliation again as the way forward. Okay, let me bring in Adam Habib. He's in Los Angeles. Uh, Adam, uh, you wrote a piece recently for a German publication. Uh, it was Deutsche Welle. I mean, you covered the entire spectrum of who Nelson Mandela is, but you were also critical. Uh, you said, and I'm quoting here, Mel Nelson Mandela was not a saint, had some great successes, but also some significant failures. Tell us more about that. Yeah, I think that it's, it's important that we don't romanticize Nelson Mandela. I think he was a great leader, and I think that one of the most positive features is the fact that he left political office. And by leaving political office, he gave over hard political power, but regained, if you like, soft power globally. This is a guy who could have phoned any president or any prime minister anywhere in the world, and they would have taken his call. I don't think many people have that influence. But I think that there were two fundamental weaknesses. One is that he wasn't a great manager. He was a fantastic leader but he wasn't a great manager. And so a lot of the management was devolved to other people uh, in his administration, and that's something that uh, we, 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 need to, we need to be aware of. We need to uh, note that there were two big mistakes that emerged in his administration, both of which he admitted. One is economic inequality. I think we adopted a very, very conservative macroeconomic policy in 1996, and I think that the consequences of that are living with us today, the increasing polarization, political and social, in our society has its roots in that, in the, in that problem. Uh, the second is, I think, the failures around HIV AIDS and addressing the challenge of HIV AIDS very early on. And both of those challenges, actually, Nelson Mandela recognized. And later on, he acknowledged it. 
and he did say that they should have moved much more quicker on HIV AIDS and they should have been much more uh, achieved a much greater balance as Ibrahim spoke about uh, around growth and redistribution. Frankly, we haven't achieved that, Ibrahim. Uh, in the first 10 years, we achieved too much of growth, too little redistribution. Now we took, talk too much about redistribution and not enough of growth. We still need to get the balance right and I don't think South Africa has succeeded uh, in doing so. Simon, when Nelson Mandela was released from prison, he preached the gospel of reconciliation, of absolution, of forgiveness. Let's take a listen to part of what he had to say. Whites are fellow South Africans, and we want them to feel safe, and that we appreciate the contribution they have made towards the development of this country. How important was that policy that he adopted there, um, that kind of, those sentiments that he was expressing to what South Africa is today? Well, I think they were fundamental in getting over the hump. Uh, I think it was absolutely critical to reassure whites, particularly conservative whites, that, um, that, this was actually, that there was going to be a, a transition that uh, they would come out of well. Um, so that was, I think, absolutely critical to the transition, as you know, we all now remember uh, after the, uh, uh, the election, the, the famous uh, the Rugby World Cup, the reaching out. Um, so yes, pivotal. Um, and it is disheartening to see that that is now sort of fraying, uh, as Ibrahim said, or uh, indicated there has been a fraying of that harmony. Tabo and Becky uh, tried to keep it going, um, but uh, during the, the Zuma years, um, that spirit certainly has faded. Adetunji, uh, you know, Nelson Mandela, as we've been saying, will be remembered for his policy of forgiveness and reconciliation. That will be seen as a major part of his legacy. Uh, but, you know, the New York Times wrote something a few months ago. It asked a question, actually. The question was, was he also a sellout to the white business elite in South Africa? Look, I think uh, a lot of South Africans are still worried about the freedom that they are enjoying because the limitations around the freedom, especially economic freedoms. I mean, you will recall that about five years ago, a gentleman by the name of Julius Malema set up a party called the Economic Freedom Fighters and one of uh, their slogan is that they would nationalize land and they're nationalizing the banks and they're also nationalizing the mines. And we've seen also that the ruling party in the last local elections, they lost uh, a lot of ground. I mean, the three, the three metros now that are run by the opposition party being the Democratic Alliance in conjunction with the EFF. And of course, under the previous president, there was calls for President Zuma, that he should go. Zuma must fall because of the serious uh, challenge that was posed to the state-owned enterprises by a family known as the Guptas. And we've seen that even recently that the former president has been attending court cases. So we're all very well aware that uh, it's not yet Uhuru for majority of black South Africans. Um, the BE has not really trickled down there's still a chasm between the rich and poor. Many black people still live in the townships, and some people have to struggle to get to work every day. And of course, we've seen that even in the first quarter, the economy has contracted. Now, we can't say that one individual sold out. What people are saying is that the negotiations in 94 to 96 did not really go far enough, that there are too many concessions given to the white minority to keep all of the things that they had gotten under the old system. That land, 80% of land is still owned by 10% of the population and even the banks are still in control. There are calls for an African bank, a black bank, and there are calls for nationalization of land. So 24 years after uh, freedom, people are saying they want economic freedom. But of course, there are critical things that we must know about President Mandela. He was a major, major player on the international stage, even when he left office. And at a time when people, African leaders, are trying to go for a third term, a fourth term, a fifth term in office, as we see with the president in Cameroon, Paul Biya, it is clear 
that Mandela, whatever challenges that South Africa still face today, they must doff their hat for a man who could have stayed in power for life, but he chose to hand over very quickly to his deputy. And we don't see a lot of that, not even in Zimbabwe. President Mugabe didn't want to hand over to his deputy. Rather, he sacked him from office. And we all know what happened later. Right. Ambassador... Uh, Anand? Yeah, go ahead, Adam. Yeah, it seems to me that there are two lessons that we need to learn. I mean, the, the, the first is if we want to truly honor Madiba, we need to honor his entire legacy. And his legacy was one about tolerance, and that was an important part of him. But his legacy was also about economic equality. He spoke about that throughout of his political life. And it seems to me that world leaders take the one message that suits them and don't take the other message that doesn't suit them. I think we need to take comprehensive, his comprehensive message, and I think we need to look, yeah. focus on that. The second lesson, it seems to me, is young people particularly, who say Madiba sold out, need to be historical. They need to understand what were the possibilities in 1992 and 1993. Because actually, if we hadn't made some of those concessions in 1992, 1993, we would be where Palestine is today, or what is much of the Middle East, or where the, the South Sudan is. And I think people who romanticize war must be challenged. And that's something that also has to happen in South Africa, I think. All right. Ambassador Russell, what is your feeling on that? Uh, at the time when South Africa made that transition to a democratic country, was President Mandela... Look, constrained. I mean, he didn't have that many options, did he? No, look, I, I remember as a young activist watching Nelson Mandela emerge from prison. And I listened to that speech he made in Cape Town. We will nationalize the mines, we will nationalize the farms and so forth, until Nelson Mandela understood that we were conducting a national transition within a global transition. And people think that we had an entire buffet in front of us. We could choose the options. As we m m moved from apartheid to democracy, our transition happened as the world was moving from a bipolar world to a unipolar world, from a collapse in the Soviet Union and the ideals of socialism and communism to a one in which the market was dominant. And so the the the... The buffet became an a la carte. We had to choose what was on, on, the, on the agenda. And that is why I think we must not judge a person out of the context of A, the skill set and the talent base of that person, and secondly, the time and the place in which that person had to operate, what was possible within it. And I think that also being a close participant and observer in yeah. the Arab Springs that happened, I would almost choose the way in which Nelson Mandela led us than, and is a dear friend of mine, than the haste with which a Bursi tried to put Mu, uh, Mubarak in prison, tried to um, poo poo away the IMF and the World Bank and so forth. Right. I, would be, I would be a lot more happy with the fact that we are still a government. 24 years later than having been a heroic government for only one year. Simon, how big a challenge was it for Nelson Mandela during that period of transition? Did he, I mean, how big was the crisis of expectations that he faced? Because on the one hand, political freedom had come to South Africa, but economic freedom had not come. And that is something that he had to tell the black masses in South Africa, that their lives were not going to change overnight. Well, I remember in covering the election, um, I think the, the Nelson Mandela and the ANC did a very good job in managing uh, expectations. Uh, they were faced with a massive economic problem. The country was uh, close to bankruptcy, uh, a failed economy, uh, and there was nothing that they could deliver properly until they'd got that sorted out. Um, and yes, they managed expectations very well. Um, and of course, the other challenge he faced uh, was from um, you know, a still uh, pretty uh, vicious uh, right wing, which uh, again, he very successfully uh, diffused in, with his extraordinary character and his ability to embrace people. There was also opposition uh, among black political groups, uh, especially in KwaZulu-Natal, in Qatar at the time. 
was opposed to him. Yes, uh, I think one of the things we, we forget um, is that this was not uh, a particularly peaceful uh, process or transition. It was a, a very, very rough time, uh, particularly in, in uh, KwaZulu-Natal. And I remember being out there seeing in the killing fields uh, as a reporter. Um, interestingly, it was, uh, it was Jacob Zuma who helped put the lid back on that and uh, make peace. But uh, right down to as we were getting towards the elections, um, you know, there was very concern about where Butelezi was going to fit in. Um, and, but they managed that. He was very concerned about that, tribal divisions in South Africa. Yes. I mean, you know, that is the, the core of, uh, of, the, uh, of the ANC ethos. Yeah. And his ethos was uh, non-tribalism, um, right. one South Africa. Adetunji, the former U.S. President Barack Obama, he was in South Africa just a few days ago. He addressed a ceremony in South Africa to mock the centenary, the 100th birthday of Nelson Mandela. This is part of what Barack Obama had to say. Let's watch. It is a plain fact that racial discrimination still exists in both the United States and South Africa. And it is also a fact that the accumulated disadvantages of years of institutionalized oppression have created yawning disparities in income and in wealth and in education and in health, in personal safety, in access to credit. So, Tinji, there's not much in that statement that we don't know already, but how significant was that coming from Barack Obama, especially when we look at South Africa uh, more than two decades after democracy arrived, and the fact that it's still one of the most unequal societies in the world? Look, I think Obama was appealing to... Uh, of course, he's seen what has been happening in South Africa. I mean, he was here in 2013 when uh, President Mandela died, and... President Zuma was being booed in the stadium. And now this time he was here, and President Ramaphosa was being hailed in the stadium, and they were singing, and he alluded to that. I think the problem is the African National Congress, having been in power for 24 years, they have to speed up and ramp up some of the policies that will reduce the inequalities that remain in South Africa that has been in place for centuries. I mean... Unemployment is a real problem. Crime is a real problem. Growth in cash in transit heights is a real problem. Immigration is a total difficulty. I mean, foreigners in this country, many of them are undocumented. In fact, the uh, minister of police went, he did a surprise visit yesterday in a place called Sunnyside, went to the police station, and they found that many of the immigrants in the cells were undocumented. Now, South Africa is part of the African Union. You cannot have too many foreigners, African right. foreigners, sitting in cells without papers. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of challenges. And what President Obama was doing was to look at the last 100 years and look at some of the changes. He says that we've made a lot of progress, but there's still too many people, women who are marginalized, young people who can find work. And he also recognized that artificial intelligence will be a problem in Africa in right. terms of competing so for much. human jobs. Well, so it was, a, it was optimism, but also laying bare the fact that corruption Dominant is European a real challenge in the world today. Yeah. And yeah. We're moving more and more towards nationalist governments or even extreme conservatism. Right. And he talks about politicians who are lying the all the time. The and they keep lying and more, more lies. So he's trying to give people hope in the midst of all the despondency that we've seen around the world, especially in some parts of Africa, where there's a lot of conflict and there's a lot of abuse of power. Okay. Adam, if we look at the evolution of politics in South Africa after 1994, I mean, we see that the ANC still has a pretty significant grip on power. Uh, but since it came to power in 1994, there have been two breakaway factions. Initially, we had COPE, the Congress of People, uh, and then we had, as uh, the ambassador pointed out to us earlier on, the Economic Freedom Fighters, led, led by um, I mean, what many consider to be a maverick politician, Julius Malema. Um, to what extent did the policies of Nelson Mandela actually lead to these fractures in the ANC? Well, I think that the, the policies of the ANC, I think that, Ibrahim is right that Madiba was absolutely strategic, and his strategic 
approach in 1992-1993 to create an inclusive future for all was very, very necessary. Having said that, I think that there were some mistakes. I think that we were too neoliberal, if you like. We were too market-oriented. We were not sufficiently appreciative of the importance of creating balance. And I think we had more opportunities to create that balance than we utilized. And I think that those mistakes lived with us and created the pol political and social polarization of present years. And I think that the Julius Malemas emerge out of that political and social polarization. So I think that the ambassador is right. We need to start addressing economic inclusion better. But if we're going to do that, we can't simply deal with poverty. It also has to deal with inequality. And if you want to deal with inequality, you can't simply look at getting people at the bottom to increase their wealth. That is important. But you're also going to constrain the guys on the top. Otherwise, you never address inequality. And if you never address inequality, you never address the social polarization that exists in society. Think about the divisions that exist in the United States and the social polarization in the United States, despite the fact that you have had growth here for 20 years. And so think about those kinds of issues. So I do think we not only got to deal with poverty, but we got to deal with inequality, because it is inequality that creates the political and social polarization within society itself. Simon, what do you make of it, uh, you know, of the challenges there that Adam Habibi is talking about? Of course, there's a new leader in South Africa. It Cyril Ramaphosa, uh, he took over as leader of the ANC, um, and, and of course he took over from Jacob Zuma, who was accused of, of you know, being involved in deeply entrenched corruption in the country. Well, I, would, I think I'd, I'd take a little issue with Adam um, about uh, the, uh, the choice of policies at the start. I think they were very good choice of policies. I think the, the problem has been implementation. Um, in making sure that, uh, you know, in terms, we have a, now a big fight over land reform has now become a huge issue. Uh, expropriation without compensation is now this watchword, and uh, it's obviously very alarming to uh, the investment community. Um, although I would argue that uh, it will, I think it will probably be pretty well managed. Um, but we got there partly because uh, the land reform uh, program and the uh, land restoration programs were not well or deliberately um, implemented. And that was actually a problem that also happened in Zimbabwe. Uh, it wasn't, that it was, it was the, the failure to actually implement good policies was the problem. Ambassador Sewell, um, no matter the economic situation in South Africa, no matter how wide the inequality gap is in that country, is it fair to say that democracy is firmly embedded in South Africa now. And uh, the world, world and South Africa, of course, can thank Nelson Mandela for that. That change will only come about in South Africa through the ballot box, not in any other way. Will that be the enduring legacy of Nelson Mandela? I must say that that is what I came to appreciate over the last two years that led up to December 2017, that the foundations and the provisions of the Constitution that was put in place up to 1996, have proven to be the most durable that we can have. It was a judiciary that was very active against Jacob Zuma. It was the Chapter 9 institutions like the Public Protector. It was a free and investigative media that was able to do its job. It was a vibrant civil society. And as a late comer to it, it was a parliament that could put Jacob Zuma um, to a choice resign or be um, voted out. And I think that that shows the genius of that early period. Sometimes we expect our leaders to do everything in parallel. And sometimes they are only capable of doing it in series, one after the other. I think I should be a lot more critical, and I agree absolutely with the professor on identifying those issues. I agree absolutely with Adam Habib when he says that the fountainhead of those issues, it's inequality. But I would say that the trick and the challenge of the immediate um, moment is one that we have to have a, an intelligent, concerted assault, a confrontation with privilege in South Africa. Secondly, 
we've got to resist the temptation towards populism in South Africa because that will also be detrimental to us. However, the third challenge is that we are having to recover South Africa of the basis of broken government, government institutions. We would expect the Cyril Ramaphosa to do things in parallel and that is the fervent hope that we all have. However, it may have a necessary sequence, a series that we need to be able to do. Restore government institutions, get the growth rate going, distribute at the same time, manage complex things like land reform and mining right. charter reviews, etc., etc. And I think that we, I am very happy that we have a Cyril Ramaphosa in place, as opposed to the alternative that was touted in December um, 2020. 17. Okay, sir, and that's where we're going to have to leave it. Thanks to all of you for being with us.